Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 603. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 12th, 2020. All right, welcome back to another show. This is a Friday show, and before we get too far down the road, thank you for all those people who sent birthday best wishes on Facebook and YouTube comments. That was special. Uh, a lot of you called me kiddo. That was even more special because it my advanced years, I kind of lose perspective of <laughs> where my age is in all the matter of things. And uh, I really appreciate all the best wishes. That was great. Before we get too far into the program, at some portion at this during the program, you're going to want to like it or not like it. That's your. I need it every time I say you can like the program. You have the freedom to not like the program. You can click thumbs down. We're not. We're not going to judge you for that. It just shows you're watching. And if you like the program and you share the program and you comment on the program and you subscribe to the program, it tells YouTube and Facebook that this is something they, sh they should promote in their algorithms a little bit more. And so our audience grows every time you like, share, and promote this through social media. And we appreciate that. You can even tweet this program if you want to put us on Twitter. For those who want to not look at two aging white faces on their computer screen, we have podcast audio only format you can find that on the show notes in youtube george how you been doing i have been tense over the past few weeks like most of america mm -hmm. and so i'm a little tense a little exhausted but at the same time i'm finding my rest in jesus christ so absolutely yeah. it's a journey it's it's not 100 percent, but i know where i need to go if from the thirty thousand foot view things are uncomfortable yeah no matter your race they're uncomfortable no matter where you are in the world they're uncomfortable no matter what your economic uh, status is they're uncomfortable no matter what your health status is how healthy you are these are strange uncertain times but certainty is found in christ your certainty is found in the unshaken god and you know i come and try and record a show twice a week with george here where we want to bring you the salt and light of the earth while reporting news accurately and uh, transparently and being ourselves which at most times are just two middle-aged guys looking at a webcam talking so there's a lot of news i'm looking here at my outline we probably got three stories we're going to cover the big story out right now it's uh currently 9 42 for the last 42 minutes on the east coast bill love has been in a hearing a disciplinary hearing for nothing he did for something that somebody else did, uh, a board did, a a governing board of the Episcopal Church. So we kind of have to back up to the last general convention where they said, uh, not in the prayer book, which is kind of the official documents of the uh, Episcopal Church, that dioceses must or can allow uh, same-sex marriages. What was it? I don't know. It was strange reading. Bishops must allow clergy and congregations who want to perform same-sex right. marriages to do it. A bishop no longer has the authority to or jurisdiction over congregations in his diocese on matters of doctrine and discipline. This was a resolution of general convention. It was not a canonical change, nor was it a change to the prayer book. Now, the prayer book will eventually be reformed and changed, but we haven't begun that process. This was a tentative step towards that direction. Bishop Love declared his di dissent, both at the General Convention and to his diocese, saying, no, I'm not going to authorize this. Members of his diocese, uh, sort of the rebellious, unpleasant faction in Albany, filed a complaint against Bishop Love, and the today is the hearing on that complaint. And that what they actually are hearing are motions for summary judgment issued both by the church attorney representing the complainants and by Bishop Love's attorney. And there are no facts in dispute. Everybody agrees this resolution was passed. 
Everybody agreed, including Bishop Love's team, that they did not aunt, that Bishop Love violated this resolution. It's now, though, a question of law. Does a resolution have authority to supersede the Constitution and Canons or the Prayer Book? The Episcopal Church's argument is, well, that's what they meant to do. Bishop Love's argument is, here is the law, here is the precedent, here is the Constitution, here is the Prayer Book. This has priority over what the general resolution of a general convention feels like. And here's the wonderful irony. J Bishop Love is using the case of Bishop Walter Ryder, who Walter, in 1993 yeah. was brought to trial. Bishop Ryder, general convention passed a resolution saying do not ordain non-celibate homosexuals. Bishop Ryder went ahead and did that on behalf of Jack Spahn. He was brought to trial and the Episcopal Church's uh, trial board said, well, I, we know General Convention said this, but it's a resolution does not have the effect of the authority of the prayer book or the Constitution and canons. And then there was also this issue of, is it really core doctrine or is it just <laughs> peripheral that. stuff? But, so Bishop Love is offering, I guess you could call it the Walter Ryder defense. Mm -hmm. Not the core doctrine business, but if Walter Ryder can get away with disobeying the straightforward words of General Convention in a resolution, why can't Bishop Love? Especially when Bishop Love's team will add, when there his position is supported by reference to the Constitution and Canons in the Book of Common Prayer. So the Chief Judge, Nick Nicely, the Bishop of Rhode Island, is a decent fellow. He's uh, an earnest liberal uh, uh, who wants the good and seeks the good, and he's under tremendous pressure because the just thing, the right thing, and the legal thing is to find in favor of Bishop Love. The political thing, the uh, mob thinking is to sacrifice Bishop Love. And so he's got to balance the will of the crazy loony left that runs the general, the Episcopal Church's uh, central organs versus natural justice and the rule of law. Well, that's the biggest thing here. This has not been passed to the point where it's in the prayer book. Mm -hmm. This is a resolution from General Convention. Uh, I, I probably have to talk to Alan Haley to get all the uh, little things of this, but it's kind of like it's been passed by Congress and not by the Senate. It's not mm -hmm. official law yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, until it is, how can you uh, try a man on it? It's strange. And you referenced before, he's one of the last conservative bishops in the church. Mm -hmm. and if, if he loses, this is it then. Do you lose hope in the Episcopal Church? Well, no, uh, because our hope is in Christ, not in the Episcopal Church. What we lose, uh, what we lose hope in, is the fairness and, well, uh, the position that uh, if Bishop Love is found guilty and it's a political verdict, it's the position that an honest cop has in a crooked police department. Um, his 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 superiors are crooked. His uh, cohort, his co his co, the other cops are crooked. He still has his integrity. Uh, I don't want to sound like I'm Al Pacino playing Serpico. <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> but, you know, our, our hope has never been in the institutions. Um, I guess I've, now that I've been doing this 25, 30 years, at one time, I re uh, John Allen, who was uh, presiding bishop uh, back in the 80s, came to my seminary after he had retired from office. And John Allen uh, was sat down and had uh, a lunch with some students and we chatted with him just as bishops do, you know, when they do with the grand tour. And somebody asked him, were there any regrets that you've had in your ministry? He'd been a priest for 40 plus years and bishop for 20 years and all that. And Allen said, yes, I've worshiped the church rather than Jesus Christ. What Alan was saying was that he had placed the needs of the church before the pure word of the gospel, before the faith in Jesus Christ. And now at the waning years of his life, he realized his error, that he loved the church and the prayer book and the liturgy more than he loved Jesus Christ. 
that's always stayed with me. And there are times when I, in my weakness or in my pride, fall back upon wearing a collar or being part of an institution or being a member of the trade union. But in the reality, it's all about Jesus and his word. It's not about this institution. It's what allows good Roman Catholics to go forward with an absolute disaster of a pope. It allows, you know, good Episcopal... It's a funny thing. There was a recent, uh, I think it was a Pew poll, where they basically polled Episcopalians as to their uh, theological and political perspectives. And guess what? The Episcopal Church is still split. <laughs> well, it's actually, conser yeah, it's conservative and liberal. It's so weird. It, well, it's actually like 55, 45, yeah. because some some conservatives may have left. I don't know if you've noticed that. I don't know that. Well, but, but you're talking about people, the, in the, people in the pews. People in the pews. Yeah. There is an absolute and utter disconnect. The farther up the food chain you go, the more disconnected you become from the facts on the ground. And maybe as an evangelical of low church leanings, I'm more comfortable looking at what is the church. It's the prayer book tells us it's the gathered community of Christian believers, the visible community. It's not the diocese. It's not the national church. It's not the bishop. Their bishops are overseers with responsibilities. Yet sometimes we turn them into little gods and little Hitlers and little little deities. So will Bishop Love be convicted? The answer is I have no idea. I hope not. But if he is convicted, I'd be very sad, very disappointed. But the work continues to share the good news of Jesus Christ, even in the midst of a corrupt and broken world. Well, the Episcopal Church needs the salt and light of Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an institution. Uh, we pray for it. We pray for its repentance. We pray for its returning to the fold. And it would be very sad if they turned out uh, Bishop Love. Um, but you and I've been in, I've been in this news business with the Episcopal Church Anglican Communion since 2006. I was there for the election of Catherine Jefferts Shorey, and after that, nothing surprised me. And so I would not be surprised if we had a conviction of Bishop Love, and I don't know what they would do. What what does convicting him do? It upholds his. It doesn't remove him from office. Mm -hmm. um, what it does, it it puts uh makes permanent well actually it depends on how hard the uh trial court wants to be and then it'll go to the court of appeals so it's not going to end with this decision it'll essentially cast in stone the right of the national church to go in and take over parishes that don't agree with their bishops theologically so there may actually be a good silver lining in this, in the sense that Bishop Love will lose the oversight of, oh, I think the church in Plattsburgh, New York, That's I hope Plattsburgh. I'm not wrong, yeah, like uh, that, yeah. is, uh, one of, is one of the uh, crazies in that diocese who basically have been a war with Bishop Love and before that, every bishop going back. That, that, bit di that parish will get alternative Episcopal oversight and there's nothing Bill Love can do. Now in a rational world, that would then open it up to all the conservative parishes to say, I don't need the permission of the bishop now to have alternative oversight because uh, if the national church agrees to some plan, it doesn't matter what Charles Benison thinks. Uh, <laughs> in other words, so there may be silver linings, but here's the thing, um, that the net effect will be People forget that the Episcopal Church, unlike any of the other mainline churches, did not decline in the 90s and up to 2000. Under Frank Griswold, believe it or not, we held our own. We are actually growing during the decade of evangelism, believe it or not, even with all the fights going on. It was when the militant faction seized power that all hell broke loose and people walked away and the liberty of conscience and basically the, an anti-American totalitarian mindset was imported at the very top. So if love loses, what's going to happen? Well, in my church, people aren't following that very closely. They're more concerned with the coronavirus, but eventually it's going to hit. 
and they're going to say, well, we don't want to send money to the diocese. Let's uh, let's uh, let's fund these projects off the books and redirect our funds. And you know, the bishop only comes every three years to our parish. So you know, what's what's it to us? We'll continue to being a quasi uh, independent church that we have to pay protection money uh, to New York for. <laughs> So pretend we're a little parish in Brooklyn. You know, you pay it to the mafia, you pay it to the bishop. But, you know, what are the long-term effects? Continued uh, financial decline as people redirect their funds to do what they think is important, not to prop up an institution that has no resonance with them or no value. Okay. Uh, and now, if Bishop Love is acquitted, will that turn the situation around? I don't think so, no. It may take a generation. <laughs> I, I I sent you a story the other day about a Birmingham, Alabama church that had deep roots into the uh, uh, city. They were provi helping provide ministries and feeding the poor, doing what a church should do. And it was a, a biracial, uh, multiracial church. Uh, half as black and has, half as white as it could be. However, the rector slash pastor of the church was white. And like some people tend to do, he's on Twitter once in a while. And he liked a tweet by the president. This was uh, brought to the attention of one of the people who follow him on Twitter. She complained publicly to the newspaper and to other uh, people in the city. And now this church uh, is being kicked out of the high schools where they worship and is being separated from the ministries that they help with the city, all because of guilty by association. Yeah, there is no free speech for white men in the United States. It's Legally, gone. I'm sure there is. <laughs> but but here here's a minister who has done more uh, than most ministers will ever do in ever. building racial yeah. harmony. Yeah. He supports the president, as do a number of prominent black politicians and leaders. <sighs> but the Birmingham School, Birmingham, Alabama School Board is in the clutches of the maniacal left. And so they've expelled them from the city high schools where they have satellite campuses for their worship. Now, if this is not a clear case, because it's the government high schools, it's the state schools doing this. If this is not a clear case of government infringement of free speech, um, I'd, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to know what is, yeah. because the um, we're we're in the this this cancel culture is taking no prisoners, and so even somebody who's on the right side of ninety percent of the things who supports the president, because he supports the president, he is canceled. And we're hearing instances of people losing jobs, of people losing business uh, for supporting the president. Um, there was a little story I read about the fate of two different pizza parlors in Illinois, one in East Moline and one in Chicago. Both, uh, ha both were defying the governor's shutdown order and both were supporting the police by sending pizzas to the police and you know promoting on their website. The one in East Moline, uh, the people there rallied around and basically they're doing great because they're standing for what is right and true. The one in Chicago, the uh, Chicago professional soccer team cut off their support for this pizzeria. The, the, the suppliers, the cheese suppliers, the napkin suppliers stopped doing business with them and mobs of people stood in front of the church demanding they close unless they supported Black Lives Matter. You said church, you mean pizzeria? Pizzeria, excuse me. So that's right. Pizzeria. <laughs> so here's the, here's, here's the thing. Um, there's, uh, whether it's a lack of leadership uh, that allows mobs to shut down businesses, or whether it's government, uh, it, well, you know, we've got this ongoing uh, running sore in the middle of Seattle that... Mm. Uh, that crazy people can uh well the the seattle where they're trying to build an autonomous zone is hilarious the first thing they did was uh have armed 
guards. George, what's the second thing they did? <laughs> Taxation. <laughs> no, they built borders. <laughs> they built borders. <laughs> it's, they're installing borders around this autonomous zone. I'm like, oh, game over. Everybody out of the pool. We're done. <laughs> We're closing for the day. Okay, then uh, the third thing they did is start exacting <laughs> tribute or taxes on yes, the businesses taxes. that were still open there that you have to pay for the right for uh, us not to break your riot windows. yeah oh my gosh and he, here's the thing you know the mayor of uh seattle, seattle and mm. the governor of washington state are walk dancing on eggshells so as not to offend their hard left supporters mm. whereas the property owners and the residents now some residents of that area may think it's wonderful i'm sure there's always you look in my neighborhood, we've got a crazy cat lady three houses down, you know. But the, uh, uh, no, Carol, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> <It's> right. <laughs> Careful who you're talking about. Oh, my. Probably yeah, I, with, you know, I got parishioners all around me. No, I'm not talking about Carol. No, no, no. She has a chihuahua, not cats, so it's difficult. <laughs> uh, but the, the inability of leaders to be able to discern right from wrong, good from bad, honorable from dishonorable in political sphere and in the church is just breathtaking. Mm. Um, when we do get these spasms, uh, here we have a, a priest, uh, a min sorry, minister, it's a non-denominational church in Birmingham, Alabama, who is doing everything <clears throat> Now, I don't know these people inside and out, but their public persona is a, a live, vital, dynamic, world-changing church, world-changing by changing the lives of people one at a time in their community, helping them out of drugs, helping them out of poverty, helping them out of education, sharing with them the world, life-changing news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the, because the minister likes Donald Trump's tweets, the city school board is shutting them down. Mm -hmm. That's frankly, that's evil. That's evil. Yeah, it's bad. Quick, we're going to finish up with the last news item here. Churches are reopening. Uh, before I get too far into that, I'm in Connecticut. I'm in the Northeast. Governor, governor Lamont, my governor, never even thought about closing churches. Why? Well, this is the hard ground of the Northeast. Church attendance, except for a few mega churches around here, is very low. And so he wasn't worried about people going to church and catching the coronavirus because there's not a big attendance here in Connecticut or Massachusetts or New Hampshire. Uh, churches in the Northeast, uh, yeah, it, it, I'll refrain and just say hard ground. Uh, now my church, it's a church of uh, about 150, 160 people. We are elbow to elbow. We, I go into the front hallway to get into the church. I'm walking down the front hallway to the sanctuary, and we're just talking all the way down, rubbing elbows, saying hi, hi, hi. We get to the church service. We're in chairs, not pews, so we, we're, we're closer together, um, elbow the elbow the whole time. After church, coffee hour. Um, I think our coffee hour is held in the smallest room possible, and you have to fight to get in there. You have to fight for a chair, and you have to fight for the food, but it's always elbow to elbow, and you're loving it because you're talking to people, and you're meeting people, and you're hugging people. That church isn't what's regathering, George. It's a, it's a different type of church. It's a church of frightened people coming to worship because they know stepping out of the house can lead to the coronavirus uh, being part of their life again. Um, they live in the fear that the TV told them not to go out. They live in a different realm of what it was like before January. The whole world has changed. How do churches regather? I, I mean, I, I'm asking a priest. I'm, the first thing you say, I have no idea, right? I have no idea. <laughs> we, we've, uh, we have a committee that Matt has been meeting to plan reopening that has mm -hmm. uh, medical and various uh, professionals upon it to advise us. They've given their report to the vestry last night. We'll look at it and make a decision. Uh, probably open the end, sometime the end of this month, beginning of July. Uh, some of the short-term things is that we're going to increase the number of services so that we're to our elbow to elbow. Um, and 
we have a disparate, we're the only show in town, so we have uh, high church, low church, contemporary church that, you know, we were able to spread out, and now we're going to have to do that a little differently. Hmm. So, but well, the, you, you also have a lot, an older population than my church. You're, you're in Florida, you have the snowbirds and that type of dynamic. Who's going to want to come to your church? Nobody. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean that flippantly, no. but uh, I have had people tell me, well, it, it's the metrics. I don't really know which metrics to trust. Income has maintained, been maintained steady throughout this. Um, so we've actually had two months now of excellent income statements because expenses are way down and income is uh, way up. And in fact, some people have been prepaying their pledges to maintain the operations of the church. And we're even debating whether or not we want to accept the PP, whatever money it is from the government, because we may not need it. Um, on Ben, I look at online viewership, and I have no way of knowing what it means. We have a Wednesday healing service. I get six to 12 people every Wednesday, and we pray with each other. It's a wonderful, quiet little service. That service, you know, I'm now doing online. I could get two to 300 people viewing it when you tally up all the you know, views across the different platforms. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea. Does it mean... Oh, well, it's 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. There's, I checked my Facebook uh, pages. Oh, oh, God, George is on. Click through that quickly. <laughs> if you're Justin Welby, it means your church is saved. <laughs> what were you exactly. ordering? Yeah. The Church of England is trumpeting these yeah. numbers of views, uh -huh. saying, look, you know, we're, church attendance has never been higher. We're reaching so many people, this and that. Now, if they've discovered a way of analyzing these metrics that no one else has, good for the Church of England, but there's no way to know uh, on the, with the state of existing, tech, existing technology how effective or how meaningful these views are. YouTube counts views differently from Facebook, which counts them differently from Instagram, which counts them differently, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. And well, so we, so on the one hand, all these metrics are up, and then on the other hand, I have people loyal people, members of the vestry telling me, well, we're not going to come back in person until the fall because we're frightened. Look what happened to the stock market earlier this week. Uh, the, the story got out on the floor of the exchanges that the coronavirus was coming back again. And the, what was it, 5%, 4%, or 5 whatever it, it was. It went down 6%. I'm smiling because I bought in. But it went down six percent and I saw Larry Kudlow, the president's economic advisor and one of the Star Wars of CNBC uh C MSNBC, yeah. MSNBC uh business before he went in the government saying there's no evidence whatsoever of a rebound. This is just market psychology. Hmm. Well the markets are going crazy up and down. And if you're how, what if you're a 75 year old woman who's got diabetes and you live alone and all you're, you're being told by your children, mom, don't leave the house because you're going to die tomorrow by breathing the air. Um, these people are scared. They're going to stay home. But, and even when they go to church, the church is their surrogate family in Florida. They can't sit next to their friends. They can't sit at the coffee hour for a half hour chatting. What is church going to be like uh, for the what? What is that experience of worshiping Jesus Christ going to be like when it's become so atomized that yeah. it's not recognizable for what it once was? And then there's going to be the thousands of churches, maybe tens of thousands, that don't open. Mm -hmm. That this was the final nail in their coffin, and um, they just weren't able to maintain uh, income or expectations or an online ministry of any sort and this is where they say it's time to close the doors the bishop says okay i'm, I'm moving you to super secret mission status and uh there's no more support from the diocese well that's it well here's the thing support from the diocese mm -hmm. what support from the diocese yeah. what support from the national church mm -hmm. um be it the episcopal church the church of england or the anglican church of canada um what ha has anybody in this crisis stood up and arisen in leadership, a new Winston Churchill, if you will, 
with the Germans on the banks, on the uh, uh, on the borders of, uh, you know, looking over the channel at them. Have we had sure. anybody arise to rally us? No, we've not. Have I had any resources from the Diocese of the National Church? No, I've not. Instead, I have Executive Council passing resolutions that we're against white supremacy. Define white supremacy. <laughs> tell me which button to push. <laughs> yes. uh, tell me which things to stop doing. In other words, they can't do it. It's mm. almost comical. It's almost comical because, you know, they're going to spend four hundred thousand dollars to fight white supremacy by giving it to the same people that they always give it to the favored radical clergy who have these experimental churches that always are failing um and what so what do we get in this time of crisis do we get leadership do we get prayer do we get no you get virtually what, it, what it's what it's yeah. doing is basically driving home the fact of how utterly irrelevant the institutional church is in the lives of most people on a day-to-day -day basis in their faith walk with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And if this doesn't make you a Congregationalist, Kevin, I don't know what will. <laughs> well, no, in the 70s and eight, all the time before the last 15 years, the media would have turned somewhere to the church and said, what's going on? Mm -hmm. How, give us a perspective in the spiritual realm and God's realm in the kingdom of how to interpret what's going on. I, I see none of that. I see, you know, the Episcopal Church calling up CNN. Hey, we got a black guy who's in charge of our operations. Interview us. But I don't see the media searching out interviews for any Christian leadership anywhere. And uh, the Christian church has lost their voice in COVID. They lost their voice in economics. They've lost their voice in uh, in race issues and gender issues. Um, the church right now has earned its voice, and it's voiceless. Um, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ isn't voiceless. The gospel isn't voiceless. The salt and light of the earth that we're supposed to be is not voiceless. And uh, it's going to be interesting times to watch. We're going to close out the program. I referred, I think, two programs ago to an announcement. Um, it's nothing big. I bought a used RV. You know, George, what that means? You're uh, going to be spending <laughs> a fortune. No, yeah, money. But I, 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 <clears throat> I, I bought in my next career. I'm going to be an RV mechanic. In this uh, RV, I've replaced the water pump. I've replaced three or four other things. I've added the Wi-Fi, obviously. I've added the cell service. So I, I have cell service just beamed into the RV. So I have instant connections when we take our little weekend jaunts or week-long jaunts or vacations. You can't really take a vacation because everything's still closed down. Um, but I'm preparing for the future when society reopens, when we're allowed to go and, and partake of campgrounds and, and visit family and friends again. Uh, I bought an RV because I knew, well, it was a great time to buy a really cheap RV. Uh, I knew that I have hope for the future that again we'll be traveling and we'll be uh, opening the national parks and the state parks and uh, I can drive my RV under the great arch in St. Louis who knows but uh, so far I'm an RV mechanic <laughs> that's what I did for my birthday I replaced a water pump yay so I have, yeah I have a parishioner who's done something slightly similar that yeah. the, he's they've sold their house and they've moved on to a boat which is parked in the marina nearby and because uh, they want to, you know, go sailing and just if they felt like it, they could just up anchor and go down to the Keys or whatever. And so I've said to him, well, what's it like? I mean, is it really as exciting as you want? He said, George, you can get the same enjoyment by standing in your shower and ripping up hundred dollar bills. <laughs> That's what boating is. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I hope RVing is not like that. No, well, we've taken a couple trips and we've had an amazing time. It's a lot of fun. We meet lots of wonderful. We went to a KOA in, in Niantic for our shakedown tour, and it was a blast because. I know nothing about RVs, so I'm having the the manager of the campground explain all the systems in this RV to me, so I don't blow it up first of all, or crash it, or or destroy his his uh, campground. And I'm meeting amazing people, Christians even, uh, out there, and I'm like, well, this is this is something new, you know that 
Because I'm in a neighborhood here, a retirement community, and nobody talks to you. I'll knock on doors. Oh, nobody talks to anybody here. I'm the president of the community, this, the uh, HOA. Nobody talks to me. No, it's, it's, it's different. Guys, you've been watching another fun-filled, action-packed show of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 602 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm going to say three. I'm going to go with three on this one. <laughs> well, watch episode 602 <laughs> yeah. and watch this episode 603 of I'm Anglican Unscripted. And, and, and Mrs. Coulson's called Mrs. Anglican TV.